I get to wear two hats um, for this particular session. Um, right now I've got my MC hat on, just to say we're starting, but um, I'm about to remove it because I'm moderating. <laughs> so welcome to our city's um, Their Tech Whose Futures. Um, this is actually super exciting So um, because there's a lot to unpack with this session. Um, this is specifically lo a local issue that we're trying to grapple with, I think. Um, as we heard that Sidewalk Labs Toronto um, is, uh, has engaged in, or has won the RFP that Waterfront Toronto has um, put forth. And um, we have some three uh, speakers here today with us who will help us sort through um, this whole um, initial project in the waterfront and maybe help us figure out like what are the questions we should be asking as a community, um, how have other communities dealt with um, the incursion of sidewalk labs into their own regions? Um, how do, should we best work with, with, the, with the public officials who are involved in making this deal, et cetera? So those are all questions that are like big questions that we all want to ask. And I think these three speakers here today will really help us um, create the framing devices for it. So first up, we have Christopher McKinnon, who is lead pub public consultation person at Waterfront Toronto. Um, next to him is Adzila Amani, who's one of the founders of RethinkLink.NYC, um, which is an activist group in New York um, that has been uh, uh, battling some of the Alphabet, uh, Alphabet's um, uh, products there, uh, specifically the Link, Link NYC terminals. Um, and then last but not least, we've got Pamela Robinson, who is a professor here at uh, Ryerson, but has also been a great advocate for the Open Cities um, uh, framework, and we're going to hear more about that from her. So first up, we've got Christopher. I guess. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Um, so I just need to get my slides up and my script. It's right there. Okay. Great. So, so, uh, okay, so I'm Christopher McKinnon, um, and I'm the public engagement and consultation practice lead at Waterfront Toronto. Um, so I'm really happy to be here, I'm, and thank you, Anna, for for inviting me, um, and I know that we want to. I know that you want to focus the conversation uh, somewhat on Sidewalk Labs, or, or like a, a lot on Sidewalk Labs. Um, but actually, uh, if you'll indulge me in my 10 minutes, um, I really want to actually tell you a bit more about what we've been working on um, independently of that project. And it's my hope that our work will actually transform the practice of public consultation and engagement uh, in the sort of civic sphere. And, and through that, I hope that it will transform our civic discourse more broadly um, and the, the sort of practice of city building as we think about it. Um, so I've called this talk uh, Diversity, Dissent, Dialogue. Um, because I think that compassion becomes instrumental to how we work through these things. And so I'll just get started from there. So I know this is kind of a conference about technology, but actually all the things that I want to say are not about technology at all. They're, they're kind of tech agnostic. And a lot of what I want to talk about is people, about how we talk to one another, and about how we see each other. And most importantly, or more importantly, how we fail to see each other. Because technology is just a tool for me. It's neither good nor bad in and of itself, and people for me are greater than technology. And so the question at the root, I think, of public consultation, or the, the one that I kind of want to put in the background always, is this one. Who's not here? I think this is a central question for me that we should be asking as we go about this work of quote unquote city building. Who are we not seeing? Who are we not hearing? How do we ensure that we are making decisions about policy, about infrastructure, about housing, about transportation? that we are doing so with the most vulnerable people in our city in mind? How are we responding to the call from our communities, nothing about us without us, right? This is the idea that no policy should be decided upon without the full and direct participation of those who are affected by it. And I think the measure of a great society for me is how it supports vulnerability, how it sees vulnerability not as limiting, but as strength. 
Um, so I think, for me, this begins with compassion. This is a hard thing to do, actually. I've been talking about this um, in the circles, my professional circles, for about two years now. And sometimes uh, I get met with the most terrified looks when I talk about the idea of compassion. So let me explain what I mean by this, because there are a number of definitions of compassion coming from lots of different places, but the one that I like most is compassion means to suffer with. To suffer with. So for me, this is very different from pity, say, which is condescending, or even empathy, which I think is really only about sharing another's emotions or feelings. But compassion for me is different because it is about sharing in another person's suffering. And what a powerful way to know someone. And what I think is powerful about that is that sharing in that suffering leads us to take action to alleviate it. So imagine for a moment a society where we all practiced a bit more compassion. Imagine we listened to one another and cared for one another. Imagine that when we encounter a person who is suffering, that we took personal and collective responsibility for ending that suffering. What could that mean? And what could that do for our practice of city building? I hope that by putting compassion at the center of our practice, that we can make the world a better place. I see in this, uh, in, in compassion, I see as being a possible antidote for the deep cynicism, cynicism that we are immersed in currently, in this late capitalist moment, right? This moment of neoliberalism's uh, colossal ascendancy, right? Liberalized market economies and government austerity, the push for privatization, this moment has arrived in many ways by design. And it has brought us to a crisis of faith in governments, in political power, and in the bureaucracy. All of these things that ostensibly we have built to serve us and keep us safe, and yet now seem to be doing the opposite. I want to think about how our civic conversations have become constrained. This idea that raising taxes to fund the things that we need to look after each other has become unspeakable, right? We are locked in a kind of scarcity thinking. We have come to believe that there is no way out. What this really amounts to is a kind of learned helplessness. It's paralyzing. And it is meant to be that way, right? This is how the system was designed, to consolidate wealth and power in particular ways, to grind us down in our opposition, to keep us heads down hustling so hard just to make ends meet that we never have a moment to think about how things might be different. And so compassion is that thing, I think, that shakes all of this up. Because when we suffer with the most vulnerable in our city, it creates a complete shift in our worldview. Toronto is a city of great wealth and prosperity, but it is also a place where we are failing our most vulnerable. And so I think if we begin with compassion, then we will see that we are also failing ourselves. Once we are actually seeing each other, we can begin to build something new. So compassion then becomes the foundation for a practice of listening and co-creation, for empowering people, for putting control of our cities in the hands of the people, right? Nothing about us without us. And this is, for me, this is really important uh, because compassion then becomes the motivation for understanding one another. It becomes essential as we seek to build an inclusive city, right? This is the key challenge of diversity. Toronto is a diverse city, but it is most certainly not inclusive. But compassion begins to get us there. It allows us to engage with diversity in a different way. It gives us a space with which in, with which, within which to begin to understand our differences. And compassion helps us to go then from diversity, which is not enough, to inclusion. When I'm thinking about inclusion, 
I want to go beyond just gender, age, and race, and I want to think about immigration status and family status and sexual orientation, which I can tell you from personal experience has real ramifications for city building and public policy. I want to think about class, because that's something that we have a lot of trouble talking about in Toronto. As the leader of a consultation practice, I think it's my duty to seek out and then amplify the voices and perspectives of people who are marginalized uh, in this world. It's our job to correct for the overrepresentation of older, whiter, straighter, temporarily able-bodied folks um, and their voices that dominate the professional and decision-making context that I am working within. So, I ask you, imagine. Imagine what a city built with compassion would look like. Could Rob Ford have become mayor of a city that was built on compassion? Would Sammy Yatim have died with nine bullets in his chest on a streetcar if this was a city built on compassion? Would there be 90,000 families on the affordable housing wait list if this were a city built on compassion? Would we continue to stall our plans for public transit, leaving whole swaths of the city isolated if this city were built on compassion? Compassion is the beginning. Compassion creates space, then, for dissent. It opens us up to hearing a message of dissent, to finding its meaning. So let's think of dissent as something that is valuable, an opportunity to push ourselves, to bring together opposing views, to listen, to understand, to learn, and to ask questions. It allows us to sit in the discomfort of dissent and conflict. It pushes us to get curious and to ask why instead of getting angry. It allows us to ask, why are you upset? Why are you suffering? How can I help? And this is where things get really fruitful, right? when we're opening up that dialogue. Because without that dialogue, it will be impossible for us to confront some of the wicked problems that we are facing, right? Income inequality and polarization, poverty, climate change, mobility, inclusion. These are tough problems. And we need honest and open dialogue about just how tough. And we need a commitment to working through these hard conversations. Because all of this for me is also about getting to a place where we can co-create a new idea of public good. That is such a problematic term, right? When we talk about the public good, whose public good are we talking about? Is my public good your public good? How do we even know? This compassion, this dialogue, this dissent becomes one that centers the voices and needs of our most marginalized and vulnerable residents. But bringing them into the conversation by giving them political agency, by ensuring they have a meaningful role in making decisions that will affect their lives. So for me, um, that, that's the compassionate city. And it's, uh, maybe I'm painfully optimistic, uh, but I think we have a shot at building that here in Toronto. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, it's been a fabulous day today. Really heartfelt communication. I come out of New York, and as Anna said, uh, <laughs> I thought I was going to be following perhaps a conversation about why I'm here. So, but why I'm here is because the city of Toronto um, has recently announced the Quayside Project, which is an alphabet. Um, perhaps even Sidewalk Labs um, partnership with the city. Uh, New York City recently has had 
uh, uh, Link NYC is what they, it's a sidewalk labs uh, movement onto our streets. One quick question before I show a video, which will explain it more. Um, who covers their smartphone with a camera? Or any smart device? Okay. Who covers the audio? Hmm. Okay. Let me um, go ahead and play this. Uh, you'll see why I ask those questions in a minute. So that's a little something that we did. We formed about a year ago, and it was pretty much like this. All of a sudden, these things started popping up on our streets, and no one knew anything about them. Um, I happened to have some friends that were tech people <laughs> that uh, were in the tech-privileged audience. And I say tech-privileged audience because these conversations um, with the civic tech community are privileged. There's a very small amount of people, and it pretty much looks like your typical tech people, white guys, that are in conversation with um, the government and making sure that they're the liaison between um, representing the city and, and having it be a do-good, service-oriented um, place. Uh, so we got together and started digging ourselves, and I'll, I'll put a little bit more towards the end of the conversation, some of our, what you can call, wins, I guess. But before I get there, um, everyone take a deep breath if you can and breathe, because um, a lot of times this is, these are not the things that we like to talk about or think about. Um, this is definitely that, that scarier side of what's going on right now. And it's easy to just turn into the good places of understanding the benefits of big data. Uh, but I'll liken some other examples in our recent history. Um, big ag. 
know, they were going to feed the world, <laughs> end hunger. And of course, that was, that was what they sold. What happened was, you know, a, a continued raping and poisoning of our land and water and increase actually in poverty and famine. Um, another, another good example would be uh, big tobacco. You know, selling us something while fully understanding and knowing the dangers. And you don't need to look very far to scratch the surface of Sidewalk Labs, Alphabet, Google. I can't keep track. I'm sure they're going to change their name again <laughs> once, the, once people um, you know, are, are, are becoming more and more aware. And I think this is the, the part that I've heard today and, and really am inspired by the civic engagement is we don't need to be talked down to and we can make our own decisions. And it is really critical that we let these uh, Goliaths understand that we are on to them and we need to let them know that early on because it, they're building it. They're, it's, it's happening right now. So uh, one statement that I might like to say, mass surveillance is a police state. That's what it is. And mass surveillance exists. Um, you, one can say somewhat voluntary. Who actually doesn't have a Facebook account or use a smartphone or GPS or you know LinkedIn. I mean, hardly anyone, right? Um, they've made they've made the barometer so low that you can't really function in society without giving up huge amounts of your your life. And when Link NYC talks about, oh, we're not tracking you. Don't worry. It's just sensors on traffic and you know air pollution and all these things that the, I've heard today they call the ecosystem. Um, let's be real that it, it is human behavior, okay? The biometric abilities for, forget about facial recognition or iris, gait, back of the head, I mean, you name it. What they're doing, it's clear we are the users in this world, I'm mean, sorry, we are the products. We are not the buyers of this technology. Google is not selling the data they're collecting from their new smart cities or the Link and Y things to us. You know, we, we, we have to, we're fighting right now just to barely have access to one little stream of the data in which, you know, there's, there's data across it. There's data brokers. Talk about a shadowy. <laughs> Does anyone know what a data broker is? A little bit. Okay, so I, I apologize if I'm talking a little bit um, in the maybe a cyber, cyber security realm, but it's important to understand, as I said, before you, before you hear all the positive things, to ask, to understand who is controlling it um, and why this investment, Google, in understanding and helping, because they are getting a return. And it's, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was Exxon Mobil's, uh, the fossil structures that were the most wealthiest corporations in the world. It is the Google and the Amazons today. And I think we need to um, be weary of the collusion between the, what one might call deep state or state actors in terms of why they want to have a mass surveillance system that they can pitch in this really friendly, smart, way to cities. Um, so, okay, so positive things, and then I'm gonna wrap up, because I think I'm at about time. Um, we informed ourselves. We were not activists for the majority of us, definitely not technologists for the majority of us. Um, we decided to do fun things, both to educate ourselves and get the word out. Um, we even analyzed um, when I think they started to get uh, a little bit of pressure, they revised their privacy policy, and we went, we went and we grappled with that, you know, because no one else, like no one else, is going to even look at these things and understand them. And um, the last bit I'd like to point out, um, when I asked you that question about your camera and your audio, what about Wi-Fi? I don't, when you have your Wi-Fi on, which is what Link NYC, you know, is like connect for free. Uh, what are you giving up? So it's important questions to ask, and I thank you for your time.
Hi, everybody. You good on volume in the back? Yeah, OK. Hey, I'm Pamela. Uh, I'm a prof here at Ryerson in the School of Urban and Regional Planning. Uh, this cover page has some logos of, of stuff that's important. The most important one to me right now is the geothink.ca website. That's the website for the research team that I work on. And for eight years now, a team of us, of, of academics, professors, um, and municipal civil servants and other civil society folks, people from um, the community sector, have been working together to try to understand what's the impact of technology on communities and on cities, and what's new and what's coming, and how do we start to get our heads around what it means in terms of civic engagement and civic technology. So I'd really encourage you to check this out. We're regrouping and moving forward, moving on from looking at open data to next looking at artificial intelligence and what it means in our communities. And so if that's interesting to you, please reach out because we really want to pitch a big tent and try to get what happens inside the university, outside and in, into the communities in which we work. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about smart cities as open cities. Um, and I'm going to say that it's not in, um, in adversarial nature to the notion of surveillance. I think the surveillance issues that come with smart cities are deeply coupled with the openness. And what these two things together really, I think, come together for me about are what we need to do is figure out what's the public interest in this new smart city agenda? How do we figure out what we need and what we want? What are the things that we're willing to talk about and what are the lines that we don't want to cross? And how do we articulate these to the people who are advancing smart city agendas so that we're a part of it, so that things aren't being planned for us but with us? And I think that that's a really important thing right now. Um, it's pretty funny. Um, Sidewalk Labs landed in Toronto a month ago and it's just been, it's interesting to see the buzz that's happened around this. And what we've had is a lot of people being really excited um, and a handful of people, I'm one of them, starting to ask questions. And a whole bunch of newspaper people calling to say, we want to really run a negative story. Um, and the interesting thing right now, because I think there's been so much happy buzz that they're looking for the counter piece to it. For me, the challenging thing right now is that there's not actually very much to comment on because not much has happened. We've had this really big launch. Um, there was a big public event. And now we need to wait and see. And the talk about the sidewalk link work that happened is really interesting because it's a real project that we can start to think about. But, but right now, there's a $50 million American investment on the table to plan something over the next year. And that process is just getting going. And I think until it gets going, there's not a lot to actually react to other than, than the buzz. And so I want to think beyond sidewalk to thinking about smart cities in general, um, in part in our community. because. Um, this investment probably won't be the first and it's not the last and um, I think we're going to see more of this work And so what I want to talk about is the intersection of smart cities and open governments So the open government movement has three tenets one is that a government should be transparent The next one is that government should be accountable and the third one is that government should be inclusive And the thing that's really interesting to think about I think in the context of smart plus open is What happens when you bring a private sector firm in partnership with a public agency that represents three levels of government, what does that mean for an open agenda? We know how to be open, transparent, and inclusive in small ways in terms of open government because we've got progress towards that. All three levels of government in Canada have open government commitments, and all of them have open data commitments in which their data is going to be opened by default, meaning that unless there's a good reason for it not to be shared or open and usable, data moving forward should be open. So we have this agenda set in terms of government and civil society relationships, but we don't know what it means on the Google and the Sidewalk Labs piece. It's a really big question. I think the thing for us on a day like today is to think about what's our role in all of this. What does it mean for smart, open, and inclusive work in terms of the work that we do? And how do we start to think about framing the things that matter to us and the work that we need to do? And so I want to pose to you a question. What's your smart city civic side hustle? OK? And some of you may have many side hustles, because that's the way our economy works. The things You have the things that you love and do, and then you have the things that you do that help pay your rent, or pay back your student loans, or, or the other things that you need. I added civic in front of it, because I think for those of us in this sector doing work with technology and with data, we need to start thinking about what's the other stuff that we need to do that's in pursuit of the public good. And this question of what is the public good in the smart city is something we're really just starting to get our heads around. And I think it's really important. And I want to just comment on a few things that, that we're seeing happening at this event today. 
Um, and I'm going to comment in the spirit of frankness and openness, because I think that's part of really meaningful democratic exchange. But also, it honors the spirit of the two people who came before me. One of the questions we could ask ourselves today is, what kinds of barriers are we putting up to having more and more people engage in trying to understand what the civic good is in smart cities? And one example I could use for today is that this amazing event, this constellation of people, I, I can't think of a time when this group of people have met in Toronto, and it's really exciting. But you have to pay to come, OK? And it, you have to pay to come because these events are expensive to get to. And this event's being broadcast on Facebook, which is super, and people will have access to it, and people are tweeting. So there are efforts to make this event open. But the real value of today, I think, is being in the room. In the hour and a half that I've been here, I've had four conversations that have led to real things that are going to happen after this event. And those things happen because I'm lucky enough to actually be here. OK, I got to hear things firsthand. I've met people like Chris, who I've been looking forward to meeting, and I'm really excited to meet you, too. Real things happen when people are in the room together. And we're in downtown Toronto. So one of the questions I have for all of us is, moving forward in this community, in this constellation of people, how do we take this show on the road? What are we going to do to go out to the people who have a vital interest in the smart city, but may not know what that interest looks like yet, or may not have the first idea about how to engage and how to get there? Which leads me to the announcement that we heard 20 minutes ago about the Canadian Democracy Exchange. Um, I'm a Ryerson faculty member. This is the first I've heard about this exciting new announcement. And that's a really interesting thing. I'm in this big institution that, that generates and shares knowledge, yet it's the first time I've heard about this. And so one of the next things I think that we all need to think about in terms of the civic and the public good in the smart city is how do we start to work together so that we're not reproducing each other's work, but also what are the kinds of things that we can do so that we're not stepping on each other's toes in inadvertent ways and getting in each other's way. And so there are some really big community challenges, I think, that come at an event like this one um, that will start to inform how we go out and work with people, not for them. No planning. What did you say? You were so good. And what was Chris's quote? He said, nothing about us without us. In the planning school, we talk about planning with people, not for them. And we really need to think about how do we make this community more open and more engaged? And how do we go out to people to reach them where they are instead of asking them to come to us? And so I'm going to end on that note. Um, and I hope we can have a conversation about the kinds of things we can do in addition to the day jobs that we have. And I'm super excited to hear the questions that you have from the audience. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris, Edzilla, and Pamela. All great um, questions. And as you guys saw, um, you know, uh, this was uh, um, uh, highly intentional in terms of bringing all three of your points of view together. And um, first of all, Christopher, I have to say, we're very lucky that you, 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 the Christopher, is actually the one at Waterfront Toronto, because as you shared with us today, um, there's some serious, um, you know, uh, intention there in what you want to bring to this practice of public consultation as we move forward with these new projects, right? And um, with Azilla, it's really nice to have someone who um, is a self-described just regular old citizen who saw something happen and decided to band together and um, create a group to try to teach themselves all about this new kind of device that's starting to proliferate in their city and then try to make, make sure that their rights are heard and, and their voices are heard, so that's interesting. And last but not least, Pamela, really you're framing around um, how we should think maybe more, less adversarially around this, the growth of the smart city, but figure out our role and, and what roles we can play is really critical. So, um, so what I'd love to do, Arthur, is maybe if we can pop up the lights a bit so that this becomes more of a participatory um, uh, conversation. Um, I think the first, uh, if you don't mind, I'll ask the first question, which is really all around um, how you framed it, Christopher, which is around compassion, right? And um, Pamela also uh, phrased it when she said, well, how do we know how Google's going to behave? In, are they going to behave in this compassionate way? And then for people like you, Edzilla, who are, who are sort of activists and a little bit more fearful about these, these uh, devices, where does compassion play a role in, with you? So how do you think, um, as we move forward with this smart city developments, where will compassion play a role? And can you, um, in, can you bring compassion to others? You, know, you can't incite compassion on Google. How, how is that going to work? 
Um, so, I mean, what, so one of the things, I mean, okay, so quickly, uh, I did want to just point out that the nothing about us without us is not my line. Um, that comes from the disability advocacy, disability rights activists um, kind of movement. Um, but, but in terms of bringing that compassion, so, so it's to, to clarify a little bit, the Sidewalk Labs deal, what it is right now, is this commitment to a one-year planning, piloting, experimentation uh, phase, uh, which will produce a, uh, what uh, the, the team is calling a master innovation and development plan which then needs to go through all of the sort of approvals that any kind of city plan would need to go through. Um, it is meant and intended to build upon the city planning work that has already been done for the Eastern Waterfront lands, which Waterfront Toronto has been working on for 15 years. Um, and so what, what Sidewalk brings to the table for us um, is money, right? Um, it allows us to engage in an accelerated, uh, exploratory and, uh, and innovation generating process um, that brings us a document that after a year, um, if Waterfront Toronto's board of directors, uh, if Sidewalk Labs board of directors, if the three levels of government um, don't approve, all of them approve, um, then it's like we walk away. But what we get out of it in the end um, is a, a copy of all of the material, all of the IP. So all of the IP is this process is shared. Sidewalk gets there copy which they can take and go and use in other cities elsewhere and you know build their you know do their work right that's what they get to monetize I guess um, and then for us uh, was at Waterfront Toronto um, we get um, the assistance of some of the foremost technologists um, you know we get their their money and their capital and the ability to bring in experts from all over the place and really um, work through the, the hard policy questions right the, pri the privacy question the surveillance question we know that's real um, and we know that's a hard one to grapple with um, and, you know, I, we don't know what that looks like yet, but what we are setting up now is the process of how we go about that. And from Waterfront Toronto's perspective, it is about co-creation with the community. It is uh, about uh, a commitment to doing, sure, what the sort of legislatively required public consultation level is, which is putting on public meetings and inviting people out to learn more and share your feedback. Um, but what, one of the things that we're really keen on is taking that consultation out into the city, going to where people are. You don't need to come to us, we're gonna come to you. Right, and that's what we're demoing downstairs is that pop-up consultation um, framework module. Um, and so we see that being in libraries all over the city. We see that being in shopping malls. We see that being in schools. We see that being um, all over the place as a, a large uh, public feedback gathering uh, apparatus that's really decentralized. Um, and then we want to use some of those big data tools, not networked necessarily, but some of those big data tools to then uh, develop insights out of all of the stuff that we collect, right? And then come back. It's an iterative process. So we're gonna keep coming back over and over again and saying, here's what we heard, here's what we're thinking now, what do you think? Right, so it's really, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it really is this nothing about us without us kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, I don't want people to think that Waterfront Toronto, uh, you know, is not coming into this with a fair amount of skepticism. I think we all are, right? Um, and that's healthy. Um, and we absolutely welcome the kinds of dissent that we've been hearing. Um, we think that's an important part of the dialogue. Um, and so, you know, you've seen some really f phenomenal uh, uh, analysis in the media. Um, I think, you know, like John Lawrence's piece, Pieces for Space, saying, you know, we're reading that. And we're reading it with the sidewalk team, right? And we're saying, this stuff is important, and here's how we, you know, here's where we want to start talking about it and tackling it. Um, and so I think uh, we're learning from them, but also I think they're learning a lot from us. I just want to say, I think there's also this really unique opportunity. Like, I, Sidewalk, when it first announced that it was coming, it said it was coming to Toronto because we're diverse, right? They picked us. They could have gone anywhere. And I think that's one of the things for me as a planner that's really interesting. If they wanted to have carte blanche and do whatever they wanted, they would have picked some green field in the middle of nowhere and gone and built some futuristic thing where there weren't any people who would have any opinions. But they chose to come here in Toronto where... You know, I said this before, but, you know, we're the city where Jane Jacobs and a bunch of people stopped a highway, right? So they know we have a reputation for being very actively engaged in the future of our city. So there's this really unique opportunity, I think, for us to think about what do we want this to be, right? How do we use this technology in a way that can help advance things that we want to work on? Um, at the launch of the event, um, Dan Doktoroff, who's the CEO of Sidewalk Labs, talked about how their goal is to bend the quality of life curve. I don't really know what that means, but I think... It's a, but, good, it's a good line, though. Yeah. Right? No, but I don't mean that cynically, but I think this question of 
Like if we think about all the things that matter here, we think about housing affordability, we think about accessible transit, we think about access to fresh water and clean healthy food and high quality public realm. Is there something in this incubation space over the next year that we can collectively seize and work with? To me, that's an exciting opportunity, but the other onus on us is the thing that they're gonna do here is likely gonna be replicated around the world. And so my goal is that we find ways to inject really good public good outcomes into this so that it's reproduced in a way that's more equitable rather than inequitable as it moves forward. It's like you're there, reading my mind. Yeah, there is a big white elephant in the room though, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you, Edzilla, which is you know profit versus public good, right? And um, at the end of the day, you know, and, and it's very clear when you hear Dan Doktorov speak and Evgeny Moritsov had the, that great piece in The Guardian um, when this was announced, um, he, you know, they're doing this to make money. And so um, the, the worst thing, the worst outcome is kind of like, I think, um, a really convenient and um, nicely designed uh, corporatized welfare environment, you know? And so I think, you know, it might be, it might be nice, it might be, you know, it might be useful, et cetera, but at the same time, it's, it's, it is still a corporate welfare state of sorts or community. Um, how do we reconcile that, diff that tension between the profit nature of, the, of this particular um, engagement that, they, that we know they've publicly said is what they're after um, and the actual sort of nature of what um, public services are supposed to do? Maybe, Adsila, you can speak on behalf of Link NYC. Yeah. Well, I was still on the... <laughs> on the compassion, but I'll, I'll come, I'll can speak to both. So the two things, time and space. We opened up this morning um, hearkening our ancestors and the land that we are currently on. And I think it's, we have to recognize we come from many generations of struggle all across the world. Um, and then this idea of space. Toronto actually isn't the first lab of sidewalk. Dan Dockeroff, um, spearheaded what is called Hudson Yards, and it's being built now and will be finished shortly, and it, it, no one really knows. No one actually knows what's going on in this area, and I think that is a critical point that we have to recognize. Um, the, I, I guess the profit, et cetera, motive, and, and more so our, who's in charge of this world ideology? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in China, it's in India, the kind of like gathering up of data that only an artificial intelligence has the ability to analyze. And take it from the Alphabet CEO himself, Sergey. He says, it's unpredictable. We don't know what it, they being the AI is going to do. And I think if we don't know how we're, right now we're just in this big data capture. I mean, if you look in the fine print of what these city smart cities are doing, it is, it is frightening. I mean, it hasn't yet you know, analyzed our poop as we're pooping or our sex performance when we're having sex, but they, they wanna be in every single part of human behavior. So I'm just gonna build on your point. So as a planner, one of the things I'm really concerned about is government citizen conversations and about development and implementation. And one of the things the smart city kind of acceleration has really shown us right now is we don't have a parallel planning process for planning the smart city. Um, you know, when we build new infrastructure, we're gonna put a new sewer or a new LRT line, we have this process by which we go out to people and show people what's gonna happen and they have a chance to influence or resist. And, you know, we've seen change happen by the public rising up. What's the equivalent around digital infrastructure is a really important question to me, particularly when it comes to the black box of the algorithm, right? What's the math that takes the big data and spits out outcomes, and then how are those outcomes used to make policy decisions? And I feel like the recent flurry um, around the sidewalk piece really lays bare how our data governance, which sounds like a woolly term, but our ability to plan the smart city we need to get up to speed quickly and figure out what's the parallel piece for us because it's normal and important and essential in a democracy that the public has vital input into where infrastructure goes but also what its impact is. No, 
not to mention the fact that the digital divide still exists. 100%. So there's like a whole swath of um, uh, regions in the north that don't even have broadband access. So we're leapfrogging towards this new type of digital infrastructure that we need to plan for. But there's a whole bunch of just core digital infrastructure that hasn't even been built and we don't know how to, how to pay for that. We don't have good data in Toronto. We have raw numbers about how many what percentage of people in Toronto are online and not, but that's not good enough in a digital governance environment. If people don't have consistent, safe, secure online access, one that they're not trading their civil liberties for, you can't have a fair and equitable digital governance platform. And we don't really know how, when, and where people are accessing the internet in a way that I feel comfortable with as a planner doing this kind of stuff online. So we, we're, we're behind. Chris, do you want to answer the profit question? Um, well, you know, sh short of tearing down capitalism, I, you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, this is kind of, here, I'll, I'll speak personally, because I can't, I won't, I'm not sure that Waterfront Toronto would sign off on this, specifically, but in my, for me, um, my pursuit of justice is unscrupulous. So, Sidewalk Labs shows up and says, I got $50 million, let's do a thing. Um, and I get to be at the table, and, uh, and I get to bring um, all of you to the table too, and we get to have those hard conversations, and we get to bring in the dissent and be like, no, this is actually an issue, and we're gonna work through it, that maybe this is a way of opening up that black box for me, and um, yeah, I guess they're gonna make profit. Um, and unless we're willing to go a lot further um, in dismantling that, right, in, 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 uh, in raising taxes to let the public sector do this kind of work, and then also really transforming the bureaucracy to be able to do this kind of work uh, better, faster. You know, it's so the city of folks I work, with, you know, the folks I work with at the city of Toronto um, and, and all around, you know, I'm in so many meetings where I am the only uh, like queer person of color, or I'm the only queer, or the only like, person of color at the table. And so I understand that is a piece of privilege for me um, to bring a voice to the table that might not otherwise be there. And so I think we just need to keep doing that, but also the, you know, the bureaucracy is not set up to, uh, to do this kind of work right now. And so uh, unless we can raise taxes, then we might not need to take these kinds of uh, corporate handouts. Um, but what we can do, which is what Waterfront Toronto has been doing for 15 years, um, is harnessing um, like real estate economics, essentially, to deliver a social agenda. Right, so we go in, we had a, an initial kind of government investment, seed capital, to do the initial planning work and build the inf enabling infrastructure to then develop new neighborhoods. Uh, but when we do deals with the develop real estate developers, um, we lock them in to a development agreement where they commit to building more sustainably, uh, ultra sustainably really, to building more affordable housing, to, to uh, extensive uh, dedications for parkland and uh, you know, raising the game and all that kind of stuff. And is it a perfect system? No. Is it uh, sort of the best that I, I can imagine doing right now in this sort of like neoliberalist kind of uh, late capitalist space? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you haven't read it already, I'd really encourage you to go back and look at Colette Murphy's editorial, which is in the Toronto Star. Um, she's the executive director of the Atkinson Foundation, and Atkinson has been leading on the signing of community benefit agreements on large infrastructure projects. Colette wrote a really interesting and important editorial early on after the Sidewalk Labs announcement about how we can start to insert community benefits at the local scale into processes like this. So it's, it's, not, it, it's being workable and pragmatic in the space that we have, but if that's new ideas to you, Colette really starts to set the table there in a really thoughtful way. You should be on the mic so it's on the live stream. Great, thanks. Uh, so Victor Willis from Park, uh, in Parkdale, and you've, you've both captured a very interesting part of, I think, the dilemma, because the current platform is not, the, the inclusionary zoning is still sitting on the table, it hasn't been proclaimed. Uh, that's the piece that you're talking about, so the 704 luxury units at the corner of Dufferin and, and King, there is not really any affordable housing being built into it, and the paltry $1.9 million compared to the total value of that um, expression of new living is quite problematic. So I think that one of the things that, I, that I'd like to hear about is, you know, that piece of architecture may yet, I mean, I, we're hoping that inclusionary zoning gets finally picked up off the table and put into some, into some action, but until that time, there have been 250,000 condo units built in the city of Toronto, and 
how much affordable housing has been, like really, has been done. So I, I, I think it's a very important part of that you're proposing, like this is proposing a whole new sort of possibility and the difficulty I keep seeing again and again is that those who really do need to be um, compassionately brought up that the city that you know the public good I don't see it so I'm just I'd love to hear that piece okay um, yes yeah, so, I mean so, so waterfront, waterfront Toronto has these sort of social uh, ma mandate that is social it's about social policy um, and so one of them a key one really is building more affordable housing now we don't build directly um, for some of that uh, stuff, but what we do is set up the planning frameworks to deliver it. Um, and so uh, the, the 500 or so units of affordable housing that went into the Pan Am Athletes Village um, and the 80 additional units of, uh, of affordable housing that are being built on the waterfront right now um, that will be operated by Artscape and owned by the City of Toronto comes as a result of the work that we've been doing. Um, we are trying to get crafty about how could we do even more and even better, right? So it, it's a long planning process for us, and so it takes you know, 15 years to get to the point where we are now, but we, maybe we're accelerating now. And we're looking at uh, a different, we wanna look at different models. So it's not just about uh, building uh, affordable housing buildings per se, um, but it's about potentially looking at uh, buildings that are mixed within, with cross subsidies, the kind of much going back to a kind of co-op model, looking at all of those different options and figuring out what can be funded and in which ways, and can we get creative about the funding if the, uh, if the capital infrastructure money is not forthcoming from governments, then where else can we get that? And so, um, you know, I think it is, Waterford Toronto's position is very pragmatic in this sense. Um, you know, we don't, we, but, but, we've, but we are sort of committed to, to trying to figure this out. There's another question there? Or, sorry, where is it? Oh, there, okay. Sorry. Oh, hello, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Alistair. Uh, I'm a Master of Design candidate at OCAD University in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. Um, thanks to all the speakers, this was great. Um, my own research focuses on public trust in government as it's affected by digital technology and big data and stuff like that. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say, uh, Christopher, thanks for uh, a word that you used right at the start, uh, being technologically agnostic. I also agree, I find myself often torn between the Elon Musks of the world who believe that robots are gonna destroy us and the Ray Kurzweil's who believes we will become the robots who will destroy us, who knows. Um, but um, the question I had, or I guess a comment, and feel free to comment if you want, all of this is around you know, big data and data that's being collected about us, um, you know, and we're only becoming more conscious of that now. I think the history of human technology is that we release something out into the wild and then suddenly we say, oh shit, like we really gotta reel this in and do something different. Um, and so, you know, data has good purposes, it has bad purposes, but I wonder if we can reach a point where, you know, we get to what, uh, some, I can't remember who, but someone's called it covalence, that, that we watch the watchers as well. Um, and, and that the data that we're sending out becomes something that we control um, in the sense of we contributed for broader public decisions, but we also control that too. Um, and I think that that's the way forward for us um, because obviously the, the data has its purpose, um, but we need to be able to see that. What's being collected about us? How is it being used? And I think that that's really important. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, well, one specific citable example is who is the watchers? So like the NYPD watches us and they sell that data to other cities. Now, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna sit and, and, and say I'm anything but not a fan of our current uh, militarized police in the sort of disproportionate way they deal out justice. And I think this is the real critical issue. Um, the thing about the techno utopia save us is that what are they gonna save us from? We have these existing issues already. I think um, the, the presentation right before us really showed that we are coming awake and we a lot is happening and yes, we are way behind and it may seem like a, a, someone else referenced to put on a tinfoil hat. Well, that's not it, just say slow down. To say no, you know, I know you want, I know you signed this contract, but just like your privacy policy, it's a piece of paper I can tear up. Yeah, there might be consequences, and I think this is the other big thing when we talk about the power imbalance of money. 
just like uh, spills and uh, spills in our oceans, et cetera, are of the cost of doing business for oil companies. Don't think that these privacy breaches, we haven't even gotten around to having a fine yet or regulations. But, even, but they've thought about that. They're factoring in the cost of business. Oh, what happens when you know an algorithm kills somebody or wrongfully imprisons somebody? So we, we definitely need to, and it's a little bit, it's a lot to take in to think that far in the future, but let's pause and think about all this data that we are, Google is very good at individualizing us and tantalizing us, and on the city level, I would say they're doing an excellent job. This is the real estate grab. Well, I think that's a, uh, uh, an interesting point, which is like, there is actually nothing wrong with pausing you know, and, and actually being more reflective about where we are. We don't have to go headlong into making deals, hence the year-long wait, perhaps, and our ability to influence that. Pamela, you have? Well, I want to come back to the transparency piece in this and, and ground it in public space. Alistair, I think your question really, it, we could go big and we can go really nitty-gritty, and that's planners, we go on the ground. But one of the questions I think that we need to think about is, whatever this experiment thing is going to be, how do we physically and transparently show people what they're entering into when they enter space that is in the land of data gathering, right? So what's the, what's the signage piece that, that's the equivalent of the terms of reference that none of us read, right? Like when you, you ever use free public Wi-Fi, I mean, nothing's free, right? I mean, we all know that you've really hit this home. And so what does it mean to move, so say Keysight is built and there are all of these data gathering things, how do we show people so that they can use informed consent about using the space? But then the other question is, if you don't want to consent, is it basically a digital gate around the space, right, in a public realm? And so there are some interesting, really everyday citizen challenges in cities that we need to think about. And it starts with the big ideas that you're talking about and it trickles all the way down to the sidewalk and whose sidewalk is it and what does it cost me in terms of my data and my privacy to walk along there. So, uh, I, I do, because we're focusing a lot on the really the high tech aspect of this, which is, is, is super important and we, that's, but, but to be clear, the, uh, the question of like data and privacy is like one out of like 11 important themes that I can, or maybe not 11, I, I haven't counted. I can't remember, um, but uh, but uh, but there's like there's there are many other things too, right? Like we got to work through a lot of detail. And actually, uh, when we talk about a technology-enabled city, some of the tech that's kind of on the table is things like bike lanes, right? Like that's technology. But isn't it digital bike lanes no. so that I can just lock my bike in and my no, phone will I mean, know that it's my bike and I can go to another digital I don't, bike lane? I, I mean, <laughs> come on, no, no. But like what, like actually, what we're talking that's about is different. RFP. Is we're talking about uh, you know different types of sensors at an intersection that helps the intersection produce like uh, flow more people through, right? We're talking they're talking about like should we look at district energy again? Like that's not new, right? Going back to the bicycle as a way of getting around the city is not new. It's not all new tech, right? And so there are actually there's a bunch of work that we're going to be able to do in sidewalk that that will be low tech, um, and um, and will be uh, human. Right? And I think that that's, that should not be eclipsed by the hard question of data and privacy, which I, which I think we all acknowledge we have to work through. Right? And I, we don't have the answers. Right? And we may come to a deadlock, or not. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll come up with something really great that we can all um, feel comfortable um, signing on to. Um, hi. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring you guys a, a bit down of the the elevation of this conversation. Um, we're here talking about uh, democracy, we're talking about uh, civic engagement, um, and we are talking about participation, popular participation. I have to tell you that uh, what I'm listening here is not my participation as an individual that is low middle class, it is not the participation of the people I work with who are tenants in the city that live on corporation buildings, and many of them live in places like Parkdale and other places, Jenny Finch was talked here today, you know, which are places that uh, there's no compassion in these places. So when I saw this thing there, um, compassionate cities, our cities, their tech, I thought we were going to be talking about something in the, in the models of uh, 
old good Jane Jacobs, Jacobs that was thinking of a city that was more humane. I can't see it here really. We're talking of a city for the middle class, 70,000 a year people that live in downtown Toronto, in the, in the waterfront. That's not, not my Toronto. That's not the Toronto of the people I work with. So I wonder if you have something to tell me about that. I have another thing to say here. Not just because I am an immigrant and I am one, when I am here or when I, when I sit on a table with government, I represent other immigrants, unless they give me the right to represent them. So that's it. Thank you. Well, I think that's one of the things we're trying to grapple with, with the, with the whole inclusion of the public consultation process, right? So I have a whole other talk about how we, uh, how we do the kinds of things that you're talking about. Because one of the things that I know has been missing from Waterfront Toronto's uh, consultation over the previous 15 years um, is that we haven't been talking to a representative, uh, uh, a representative s uh, selection of, of all the residents of Toronto, right? Because, because historically, public meetings were done in geographically located areas, right? Um, and so you only reached out to people that were nearby. And so it affected who could come. And so we're now imagining how do we change this and invert this? We still have to do that because it's the law. But how do we change that so that we're actually gathering information by going out into communities and talking to folks um, who, where, where they are, making it a lot easier to get involved, also helping them to understand why they need to get involved. And so a huge part of the engagement framework, the public consultation framework that I'm working on right now is how do we use that public consultation process to develop uh, community capacity out in all of those other communities. So they help you learn about the sort of this, these co-creation models and then bring them to your ward, right? And work, uh, you know, we, we'd like for what the things that we're doing to start happening in a lot more places. Um, and I'm particularly interested in, when we're, as we're tackling uh, models of affordable housing for the waterfront, we're not talking about only creating affordable housing for people that make $70,000 a year. We want to try and figure out how to uh, how to, how to make it truly affordable, not the CMHC's uh, definition of affordability, which is not really affordable for many people. Well, and I'll just add to your point, I and mean, I want to go back to what Victor raised earlier. The power imbalance and the capacity imbalance is tremendous. I mean, the voice of Park, for example, in this conversation is vital, but you're really busy doing the work of Park, right? And this is added on. And I, I'm, I'm suffering from a bit of a crisis of imagination here, but I keep going back to in the old days of environmental assessment hearings, there used to be something called intervener funding, where the government would give money to organizations who wanted to participate, recognizing that there was a tremendous gap in the ability to participate on equal ground. And, and I don't know if that's possible. It's but part of the $50 million that Google's giving Waterfront Toronto, isn't it? Intervener funding, perhaps? If I propose it, maybe. <laughs> but I think it's good for us to think about what, how do we set a table so that people are able to come and participate in fair and equitable, inclusive ways? And we can't shift the burden onto already stretched organizations who are doing really good work that's vital to their mission. And so... I mean, I want to be careful, though, because I don't think that the only way forward is to get, is to have people come to us, right? And I, uh, Go to them and... Yeah, no, it's, and we've got to do all of it, right? Yeah. So it's, this is about a diversity of tactics um, to, to shift all of this stuff. Yikes! <laughs> We're running out of time, but we have one last question there, and then you guys will just have to come and talk to us after. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Sutton. I am a spoken word artist, and um, yeah, also volunteer director with uh, Mike for Guelph. Um, one thing I'm noticing in the conversation, it's something that was touched on over here in the planning and something was touched on by the woman who represent, not represents immigrants, but who's an immigrant and raised a really important point. Uh, in the conversation, what I'm noticing is that people themselves are always spoken in this kind of, they're in a distant kind of second voice, passive voice of public good, consultations, consent, and it's all without agency. So where is agency in this? Where can I create with this? Where can I, be, as a spoken word artist, be like, oh, cool, sidewalk thing. Here, I'm going to do this and make something of myself as an asset in the community that benefits the community for and of itself. Is there room for that in a project like this? Is there room for that in smart cities where there's actual agency 
in that. Like I have ownership over the thing I create in this space. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, right. So, like, we're designing this process right now, and but this is a this is a key interest of mine um, in seeing this through. Is is how do we like what does co-creation with the community look like? Well, let's talk about that together, right? And then that informs the plan, right? What is it that you want to do or bring to the table or have be part of that space that we're creating? Um, and what do you need to do it? And then let me figure out if I can put those resources in place for you. Um, so it's sort of like. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask a question since this is a, a, okay, there's a break. We don't have to go on break if you don't want to, and we can continue. Yes? Yes? All right, fine, go. <laughs> Hi. I, I just, I appreciate uh, what has been said. Uh, Silicon Valley has a hard time imagining someone who doesn't love apps which is actually a lot of people in the world. So it, it's very difficult when um, we humans are, are just like users. We're, we're not really thought of as, as the customer. And so we, will, we do our best um, to get what we like. You know, We have access to our video. We can post it. But we're not going to have all the back, back channels and the information about um, the wealth of who is watching it, for instance, uh, or all the other kinds of mass amounts of data that is out there that we have no idea about. So it's important to understand when we get something that we still know how much we're giving away. Hi, uh, my name is Rose, and I just want to touch briefly on economics. Um, you talked about taxation, you talked about real estate value. Um, another option is the data. So there's a premise that there's a fair exchange of value between the data collection and free services that are offered by people or platforms like Google. Um, in a discussion about how to fund universal basic, basic income, um, there's a suggestion that you know they should pay for data and to the, for the privilege of putting those terminals out. Um, not that we, you know, the free services, but if they're putting uh, terminals or, or any other collection devices in public spaces, that they should pay for the right. Just like your comments. Great, thank you. And then last question up there. Okay, and then last question. Okay, okay Mark, and then. Okay, hi. Um, I, I, I think some of the intentions described around the consultation process on the surface seem like it wants to be very inclusive, it wants to be, it wants to do the right thing. But there's a difference between the speed at which corporations run at, particularly high-tech corporations, and the speed that municipalities run at. I don't really understand how you can be, you can do everything that the process is talking about within a one-year period. The, the, the implications on policy, the implications on just what are the questions for this new form of civic en engagement that is going to have to be required for, the, the, for citizens to actually understand the very questions that we're grappling with? That's going to take time. Because at the end of the day, the concern, I think, for me, is the continuing commodi commodification of community within a networked environment. That's an entirely different set of concerns from when I see uh, structures in my neighborhood getting torn down for a condo, I can identify with what some of those issues are because they're very local. But this has a very different set of implications attached to it. And one of the questions, therefore, that I have is, what are the stages imagined after the one-year incubation period in order to ensure the continuing consultation that people are going to have a chance to shape what this is? Um, so, so the process of consultation doesn't end after that one year period. It's not like we make a plan and then we just go implement that plan, um, if it's approved. Um, it, as with all of Waterfront Toronto's projects, we, uh, we do upfront consultation, then we do consultation as we're planning, and then we do uh, more consultation and more consultation, and then a plan goes to City Council for ratification or for approval, um, and then there's more consultation as we begin to implement, and there's a consultation at every step of the way. And so the traditional way of doing that is that there are particular milestones where you do consultation, you gather feedback, and you have a set process. What we are imagining now is a more continual process that never stops gathering that information, that never stops going out into the community, 
and various communities and seeking out people that we haven't talked to. Um, and, uh, and, you know, with, with, if, you, if you go and look at the pop-up that we've put downstairs, um, it's, uh, part of it is about, uh, is about giving you information about the project as much as it is about uh, asking, for you for your, asking you for your feedback. So helping to inform um, and build that capacity to consult really effectively. Um, and so uh, I, I don't expect anybody in the room to, to just trust me <laughs> um, because I would never, if, uh, on the other end of things, I would never give you my trust in that way. Um, but uh, but, but we, I'm really intent on, on having us demonstrate yeah. that, uh, that, that this is going to go in a good way and that um, if we get to that point a year from now um, and, and folks are really unhappy with the result, um, that it is really, everybody should be really clear that we can just walk away. And I don't mean we as Waterfront Toronto, I mean we as the city of Toronto. Last question, so we can move to our keynote. Last keynote, folks. So it's, my, my, my comment and question is directly on that point. When you bring the people who haven't been at the table into the room, or you go out to them and speak to them, will you give them the option to say no? And if they say no, will you respect that determination as community self-determination, which we do not have right now in this city? Will you respect that process? Is that going to happen? Is there going to be that opportunity? Because otherwise, this compassion that you speak of is lip service, it's community marketing that you're doing on behalf of Waterfront Toronto and on behalf of the investors, which we constantly see. And honestly, like on a community scale, we know what's happening. You know, with Daniels, with Choice, has they come up and come out and do this type of marketing with us? They take their marketing budget and now they're investing it in pushing or making sure that we don't push back. So you mean no to the, no to the plan or, but, or no to actually engaging with the process? No to the development. No to the, no to the development. Um, uh, it, it is hard for me to imagine uh, if there was a popular upswell of opposition um, and people saying no that this could actually go forward. Because the political, ram the political ramifications are, uh, are real, right? Politicians, don't, they, they, they ultimately, you know, the, the way that the political system works is that if they can't win an election, you know, that affects their vote. You know what I think Chris is saying is that this is the reason for this conference. You know, first of all, thank you so much for being here and, and, and taking the hot seat. But more importantly, the whole purpose of this conference is that, you know, who's go what's going to make sure that that doesn't happen is that we have to actually show up. We have to do that work to make sure that if we want to know that we're part of the process, making sure that we, we get what we need and we get what we want, and we need people like Pamela, and we need um, case studies like RethinkLink.nyc to show us how they did it. So thank you very much, everyone.